Have you ever been to Africa on a rainy day? Sweltering storms, then it all goes away. The innocent look in those eyes are telling me something's wrong. Amidst the cries, I can see a mama trying to feed her little one. I can see lots of mamas trying to feed their little A modern day world in material ways We think we have worries Are we all in a day? Which doctor says all the ills will go away? No medicine, no rules AIDS is here to stay I can see elephants through the lazy amber sun There's no elephants in the squatter camps of fun One of the things that we said we talked on for um, Michael Such as why you both shared such a love for Africa Well, Africa gets into your boots You know, you have the savannas Grass is streaked with gold, you have the saffron silhouettes on the edges of the mountains, the acacia trees that are sort of bent by the winds, and it just gets into your soul. You feel close to the whole spirit, you know, the nature of its people, their simple lives, the rituals and beliefs, and, and Michael shared this empathy as well. I suppose as a, a descendant of some slaves, the ethnic background and soul of Michael would have been obviously, you know, Africa as well. But you reach a stage in your, I suppose, love of Africa where you just instinctively know yourself that Africa has accepted you. The children, it's their humbleness, it's their shyness, it's their white teeth shining in the moonlight, their laughter, it's just, Africa just becomes part of your soul. And it's something that there was certainly an empathy that, you know, sort of existed be 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 between us regarding Africa. And um, then, I suppose, in terms of uh, the consequential diseases that sort of, you know, have inflicted in the, the African continent, Michael and myself, you know, sort of for different reasons, probably would have had an interest in the whole disease process. It's interesting, you know, sort of, you know yourself that Michael, in 84 on the Victory Tour, he donated 5 million of uh, that tour's profits to, to, to charities in Africa. In 85, he wrote, and We Are the World, I think it was, wasn't it, with Lionel Richie, and he gave all the proceeds again to you know, people in Africa. And, and right through his life, again in the same sort of period, I mean, you take 93, he, he had toured for 18 months on the Dangerous World Tour. That was like 67 concerts. And he gave every bit of it to Heal the World Foundation. And um, again in 99, he gave it to, to Nelson Mandela. My interest is, is interesting, um, I suppose, in, in HIV per se, <clears throat> was slightly different. In, in 1986, when I was a young doctor in one of the Dublin hospitals, I had a patient who was only 17-year-old that came in one night. He was a HIV patient. Sorry, I didn't know at the time. He was an asthmatic patient that was... Um, going downhill rapidly and I needed to get an arterial blood from him and um, he um, was a heroin addict we needed to get um, a line on him and um, he, all his veins had hardened both in his arms and in his legs and at that stage we didn't even really know we hadn't even a proper you know sort of understanding of HIV we thought you know sort of if you kiss somebody you would die from it 
And I had a situation, I suppose, where I was looking at an artery to get an arterial blood gas. He thought I was looking for a vein, and he turned around and he says, Doc, I have one here. It was a special vein that he needed to sort of give himself heroin. And as he turned over, he knocked the whole blood things off the bed, and the needle stuck in my leg. And he turned around and he says, oh, I'm HIV positive, you know. So I just turned around to one of my friends, uh, Owen Brady, who's now a consultant orthopedic surgeon, and I said, Owen, look, at, I want you to do something for me, blah, 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 bring me to theatre. We cut a lump out of my leg, and at that time, you know, sort of went through it. I still have the scars from it, and we went downstairs. I continued my night's work. I had to get screened, and when I went to Professor Mulholland, maybe, uh, in UCD, she says, don't worry, Patrick, the only people who have ever contacted HIV had an intramuscular stab, and, you know, the four that have died that are medical have it sort of accidentally injected into them. So that wasn't the right thing to tell me, seeing that I've actually had got it stuck right into my leg. So for the next three or four years, I had to screen myself twice or three times a year to make sure it never appeared, and thankfully I never see her converted. We probably were among the first surgical excision of the virus, let's say. And it was through that then that sort of when I started traveling through Africa during the 90s that I had, you know, sort of an empathy with people who had causally also uh, got the disease through, through no fault of their own. Particularly, I felt very bad for, you know, the wives and families when a lot of uh, lorry drivers would have been driving all the way from Zambia to, to Cape Town in South Africa and um, on route meeting prostitutes, becoming infected and then coming home and infecting their wives and, of course, their children. And during that period, I hate to say it, but it's very, very true in my mind. I was in and out of South Africa a lot and it was seen as a black man's disease. So it wasn't really an apartheid thing. You'll see it in many sort of situations. I suppose in the United States you could have a situation where it happened as well, where a lot of homosexuals, Haitians had it, and a lot of people, including probably black American cities as well, would look down and say, oh, it's those Haitians that are carrying the, the, the disease. We've seen this many times. You know, sort of syphilis was called the French disease, the French call it the Spanish disease, and everybody wants to call anything that's associated with immorality or sexual deviancy somebody else's disease. Now, there's no doubt about it that sort of, you know, during the 90s when I knew I was fine, I, I worked with HIV colonies in Africa and in many ways, I suppose, started to alert the world because I was writing articles from that part of the world on HIV. So I had a mixture of two things then. I suppose number one was a keen interest in anything to do with HIV, a humanitarian streak that probably I've always had, and a lot of Africa, and, you know, sort of Michael had the same things the other way around. I'm sure he was never exposed to the virus, but certainly within his soul, he was very much a humanitarian that loved Africa. And even though he'd been on tour in Africa, he never really was in the Africa that I knew, not down the East Coast, which is the most beautiful part, I think, from Kenya to Tanzania to Zambia, all the way down through um, Zimbabwe, which is probably one of the most beautiful countries in Africa, Uganda, of course, as well. And these were the English-speaking countries, so it made it very easy for us. And... Um, uh, Michael, in many ways, of course, has spent a lot of his time with Grace R Rwanda as well. And Grace, of course, absolutely wonderful person, had been brought up in Rwanda and um, had went to school in Kampala in her early years. And um, I suppose listening to Grace as well, Michael decided, you know, what I really need to do is get back down to Africa and I'll do a show there. I'll do a massive world tour. It'll be my comeback thing. And what he intended to do was get uh, airfield in Rwanda, and I think Grace knew sort of, you know, the, the relevant people, and um, to run a big concert for HIV there, you know, and this was in the period where he still was going to London for the World Music Awards to meet the Queen, and technically it didn't happen, it's a pity, but he had, uh, before he went back to Las Vegas originally, you know, tried to set up the initial thing, so his heart was certainly in the project. That is so, so amazing. I, th that you survived it all. Sure. I'm just going to ask you one last thing, and that is, sure. what is your fondest memory of Michael? Deepest memory of Michael is something that probably at this point in time I wouldn't like to mention, but um, in a way it's relevant, and it may sort of come up, you know, during the trial. It was in Michael's house one night, and um, after he had his surgery, 
um, to his nose area, his, uh, his skin was very, very sort of tender in, in that area. Now, I'm not going to cross the line and say what procedures we had done. It's well known to everybody that Michael had sort of um, uh, surgery done to sort of extend, you know, sort of the bridge of his nose to make him look a little more Caucasian, and that sort of, you know, had uh, perforated the, the nasal area. Um, but suffice to say that Michael was very, very tender sort of in that area, and we had something to do, and I'd say no more about it. But we were in the house, and he himself, you know, sort of could have had um, um, medication to sort of sedate him to do something, and he stood there, and he took the pain and ran around the room with, you know, sort of his hand in his face, sort of, you know, saying, you know, um, this hurts, this burns, blah, blah, blah. Uh, let's say no more about it, but that is my lasting memory to now see him uh, cast in sort of a level of um, a shadow that he was a drug user or that sort of um, he would use uh, certain sedative uh, drugs in the absence of an anesthetist. That certainly wouldn't be my memories, and I suppose the small thing I alluded to there a moment ago will be the one thing that will sort of, you know, sort of be remembered in my mind. Now, the thing is that a lot of people will go through different experiences regarding Michael, and I know there are sort of, you know, a lot of fans out there that will try and remember him in their own way, but in many ways, believe it or not, I feel that some of his fans are still going through... Um, stages of grief, almost bereavement. And you know the way that the, the seven stages or the five stages are shock and disbelief that everybody has gone through, almost denial that has happened. Then you have a bargaining phase. It's the same thing if your mother dies, your girlfriend leaves. Guilt, anger, depression, acceptance and hope. Now, I only mention this because I, as I note the, the way that sort of the fans you know, sort of are changing, that suddenly it is in a stage now where people you know, have almost moved beyond the guilt thing. Why don't we do something to help them? If we only could come back, we could do this here. Blaming others you know, to try and reconcile the loss. But now anger is coming in. Anger against Tom Snedden. Anger against you know, Codrand Murray. And as a consequence of that, I like to see that because from a medical point of view, this is almost where the fans are coming in out of the bereavement sort of stages. When you reach anger, you're not too far away from uh, final acceptance and sort of and, and hope. You know, and that's the seventh and that's the final stage of grief. Now, the thing is that within the concept of that, you do have healing phases also and there's sub-phases. And you think that you remember people as they are and that helps to get over the loss. And in many ways, I suppose I'm participating in this show because I know that some fans that sort of may be listening want to extend to somebody who actually knew Michael, who sat with him or who laughed with him, who joked with him. And this, I suppose, is, 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 is a good thing. It's a good medically, it's good psychotherapeutically if you remember people as they are. Then people, you know, sort of will cherish and share their memories among each other. And we can see this sort of on all the websites that both Deborah runs, Seven runs, um, you yourself, Catherine, of course, and the great work you do. And I suppose what's technically going to happen is by the time the trial runs, and we're in a pre-trial in, in sort of January, it will reach a stage where I suppose where a lot of the wonderful fans that he had, and Michael, I must say, totally always loved his fans, and there's no doubt about that, almost to the point of you know putting them before everything else in his life. The fans will have moved into a different stage. So I think if the trial had been in 2009, when the sort of death, the stroke, homicide had occurred, there would have been uh, such a public outcry because of all the wrong that was done to him that by the time that the trial runs, I think that people's feelings and attitudes will be tempered to such an extent that they will start probably looking at people who originally did wrong against him. You know, they'll be in this angry phase, you know, and it's not a guilty phase. Why did he have to die? It's more an angry phase that we, you know, sort of now should look at the people maybe who created this and be very angry against them, you know. And, and in many ways, you know, that's a healthy stage to be medically. If I could draw the analogy between just bereavement reaction, um, which I suppose in many ways um, I think there's a very, very strong parallel analogy there. That's amazing. I am going to ask everybody um, if you are 
going to call in. 